Uh, I'd always uh, wanted to get back to the Far East, and uh, I was born in Korea. My father was a missionary there, and I heard him talk about uh, Korea and uh, talk about the Japanese. You know, he had a lot. Of, he had a real problem with Japanese occupied Korea at that time when I was born. And uh, so I'd always wanted to get back over there. And uh, so I uh, actually, when I was in the Navy, I put in for a transfer to the to the Houston, which was a cruiser that was over there. And I'm glad it didn't go through because uh, it was sunk. <laughs> How did you find China? Is it was it completely what you, you didn't expect at all? No, I had no way of knowing uh, that. Uh, we trained in Burma, and uh, of course, when we went uh, moved from uh, Burma into into China, uh, it was very primitive. You know, they're living. Way they did 5,000 years ago, you know, people still binding feet, and uh, uh, very few vehicles, mostly ox carts, and and of course I saw it when we landed, <coughs> when we came in there, uh, we got word that the Japs had just bombed Kunming, so uh, the old man uh, moved two squadrons up there. Well, this is. When I first understood what war was all about, because uh, the Japanese had come in and had bombed right into the city, and uh, there were many, many people dead. You know, civilians. I'd say maybe a couple of hundred. You know, kids with legs blown off and arms blown off, and and uh, so that's when I really realized what the war was all about. Before you got to Kunming, uh, when you were in Tunggu. Tungu, uh, yes, Burma. Uh, we were in Tungu. Can you give us an idea of, of really what all of you guys found yourselves in, like the living <laughs> conditions, the weather, the food? Uh, yes, I sure can. I'll tell you, Tungu is a, a, a terrible climate, you know. They have the rice paddies and the insects were just, uh, you can't believe how many insects. Matter of fact, they used to bring our meals in two plates. They'd have one here with your food and another plate over it. Uh, then you'd have to take that plate off and really start eating fast, you know, to keep the insects off of it. And, of course, the only relief we had from the insects was at night when we'd get under the uh, uh, mosquito nets. As a matter of fact, we had a guy that's kind of interesting uh, antidote. Uh, we called him Fearless Fred Hodges. Well, they found out that he was really f frightened of any kind of insect. So once the guys found out about that, they made his life miserable. You know, he'd be asleep under the net, and they'd put some insects under that net, and man, he'd come out of there just wide out, you know. <laughs> uh, the weather conditions, had any of you ever, yeah. did you underestimate the weather? Well, we, we didn't know. It's just typical, uh, typical uh, jungle weather, you know. It's just really very humid and uh, hot and 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 humid, which is real bad. We'd work, uh, we'd get up very early in the morning to train, you know, about daylight, and we'd go through our training, but because the heat was just almost unbearable. And uh, we were about uh, eight miles away from the little town of Tungu. We were at this airport about eight miles away. And uh, so we didn't, and we had no, no transportation other than bicycles. We all bought bicycles, so we'd have to ride into town, you know, to to uh, fool around or, or whatever. And but it was uh, it was very primitive. Mm -hmm. um, when all of you actually arrived in Burma, um, I've read that uh, a lot of men were out of shape, and Chanel actually purposely made sure that the guys would bicycle into town to get in shape and, and to train for what was ahead of you. Is that correct? Well, uh, a lot of us were in pretty good shape, you know, because we came <clears throat> we came out of the we came out of the military, you know. We were recruited out of Army, Navy and Marine Corps and we we're professional people and of course we'd been flying uh, every day and uh, so we were in pretty good shape really. Even after the boat ride? Yeah, well the boat ride <laughs> took its toll on us really. But uh how? It was, uh, well, you know, we were drinking a lot of whiskey, and uh, 
in, in my ship, we had, uh, these were Dutch ships. And uh, in my ship, uh, we had about half missionaries and half uh, AVG people. And uh, they, <laughs> I don't know who converted who on the way over there. But the, the missionaries had a very fertile field to operate in to try to convert us. On your passport, what were you down as, as far as your occupation? They had me down as a rancher, but a lot of them were acrobats, and they had all kind of things on a fake passport, you know. But I think the Japanese knew everything that we were doing. They had, their intelligence was very, very good. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell us, I want to get back, well, uh, as far as the conditions at Tunggu, yeah? Uh -huh. um, what was the food like? Yeah, the food, uh, food was not good. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, when we moved out of Tunggu back down to Rangoon, uh, we, uh, we finally, uh, the British were supposed to feed us, but their food was so bad, you know. How? Uh, well, I mean, they, they eat, their diets are different than the Americans are used to, you know. We kind of like uh, ham and eggs and bacon and eggs and a few things like that. But there's mostly tea and real greasy bacon. Uh, they wouldn't cook it too much. So what we did, we had a crew chief by the name of, uh, oh, Lord, uh, forget his name now. Uh, but anyway, he volunteered. He had done some... KP in the army, and uh, and so he he agreed to uh, do the cooking. So we just passed the hat and put the money up. He'd go down to the village and buy stuff, you know, and then cook it up on a kind of a barbecue pit. Have you seen that Life magazine with Shirley Temple's uh, picture on it? Copy of it. You have you have seen it? Mm -hmm. Well, you see uh, you see that. I had a had a barrel like a barbecue pit that this guy had made, and uh, he, uh, but he was so things began to pick up. We ate well. What did all of you guys miss the most after arriving and undergoing the training? Uh, what did you all miss the most? Well, a lot of guys uh, uh, they couldn't stand a harsh environment, you know, and some of them went home. And, uh, uh, but, uh, you know, most of us, uh, might have been a couple of guys that were married, you know, but we most of us were single. And so we were, and we were eager, you know, to, to get into combat and see what that was going to be like. And, but, uh, I didn't uh, miss anything other than maybe food. We had a bad problem too with, uh, dysentery over there. You had to be careful and uh, boil all the food, cook it real good. And uh, I know I only had dysentery one time and that was because when we moved from, when we were stationed down at uh, Rangoon, we moved out to, uh, uh, I moved out to a place where I could get some sleep. The Japanese were bombing at night there. And so I went out with the ground personnel and and this uh, Indian barra they had, uh, he's, he's supposed to been boiling that water, but he wasn't. He was just straining it through something like cheesecloth, you know. And I can tell you, when I got this dysentery, I took a sample of that water down to the British Hospital in Rangoon, and uh, I can tell you, it looked like a menagerie. You never saw so much stuff in that water in all your life. So uh, that's the only time though I have problems. What was your impression of uh, General Chenault? Oh, General Chenault was Your first great. impression? Yeah, the first impression was he's a guy that's strong. His, his features indicate that. But uh, he impressed me as he's a guy that really knows what he's doing and a uh, strong, strong man. And I was right, he was. The first test for the AVG, I understand, was really the first at attack on Kunming while AVG was there. It was right. December 20th. Can you, can you describe to us, like when the Jing Bao went up, yes. can you just take us through it? Well, it's unfortunate. I was on the uh, schedule for that, and <clears throat> I had taken a break when they came in, so 
So the guys got off, and I wasn't on that mission, but I was there. I came back to the ground. I could listen to the radio, you know. But apparently they came in, and they intercepted them about 40 miles out. And, uh, and they, <coughs> I think they shot down four, actually. And then only one, I think, ever got back to the base. Yeah, they went along, but there were four that were shot down right in the, in the area. But uh, I was talking to Tiger Wong, and he said that there's only one that got back. And he was down there with the intelligence. Uh, uh, matter of fact, he's the guy, his group were the ones that would tell us when the guys were taking off. We knew when they took off, how many there were, and where they were going. So, uh, uh, but that's the way, that's the way it, that first raid happened. We only lost one guy on it. Ed Rector uh, got lost, and he he went in, went into the uh, mountains over there. But he got out okay. Didn't he kind of break the rule and and decided to uh, Ed Rector, Colonel Rector? Didn't he kind of uh, instead of the, the teamwork uh, that was taught in, in lectures, he went off on his own and chased after some of the. He did uh, one day, yeah. Uh, when we were at Lawyer Wing, uh, we had a <coughs> we ran into an observation plane, and he took off up to this observation plane, and uh, a lot of us had given up because we were at, at the extreme range of our fuel. Uh, but Ed stayed with him and caught the guy, and he shot that one down. Yeah, Ed Ed Rector is a very tough competitor. You know, he he was a good athlete. Went, when he went through Pensacola, he played football and everything, and he was a real good athlete, and he was very aggressive and a good competitor. 